This is part two of the chapter 20 lecture notes. And <clears throat> we we kind of left off here. Um, the last group for this um, golden retriever <clears throat> that we were talking about is the order carnivora. And then the family is canine. We call them canines. And the genus is Canis. The species is Canis lupus. And the subspecies, which is the most specific, is Canis lupus familiaris. And notice that the species name is written with the genus name first capitalized, and then the species name lowercase, and the whole entire word, the whole entire scientific name is um, either in italics or underlined. And that is um, a system called binomial nomenclature. Binomial means there's two names. <clears throat> and um, the genus, the species name is the genus plus the species epithet. So Homo sapien is the species name for human. Is the epithet is the is the um, species epithet. Okay, so how do how do scientists determine evolutionary relationships? Um, a bird wing and a bat wing are what we call homologous structures because they share many of the same bones. Their um, structure is very similar. In this case, the function is similar as well because they both um, use their wings to fly. But um, the, a, dolphin fin, um, a dolphin's um, pectoral fins actually have the same bone structure as a bird's wing or a bat's wing um, or a similar bone structure. They have this upper arm bone called a humerus. And then these two bones are the radius and the ulna. Frogs have the same bones, um, those same three bones, and then the rest are the digits. So um, these are homologous structures because they um, came from a common ancestor and um, they don't have to share the same function, but they, they share a similar structure. <clears throat> and here's another, here's an example of that. Homologous traits, homologous characters are similar because they share an ancestor. So they don't necessarily have the same function, but they have a similar structure. And you can notice here the bones in brown are actually called the humerus, the upper arm bone in a human the humerus, and then the bones in um, the cream color and the red are called the um, radius and the ulna. The radius is the cream color and the ulna is the red. And then the carpal bones, the wrist bones, are yellow, and your digits are dark brown. So a human arm, a dog's um, front leg, um, a bird's wing, a whale's um, fin, these are all homologous traits, and even though they have different functions, they have similar structure and similar ancestry. Now, analogous characters are opposite. Analogous traits or analogous characters do not um, indicate that there's, there's uh, a shared ancestor. They're similar due to environmental pressures, environmental constraints or environmental pressures. There's a pressure for the dragonfly to um, be able to fly so it can get around better. And there's pressure for birds to be able to fly. Um, so during um, evolution, these animals, you know, um, they develop this, um, these wings to, to help them fly but they're definitely not homologous traits. They don't share a common ancestor, and um, their, their structure is totally different, and there are no bones in a dragonfly's wings. So 
Um, analogous characters can be similar due to what's called evolutionary convergence. And convergence occurs in unrelated or distantly related taxa. Remember, taxa are just groups. So distantly related um, groups of organisms. And, um, and what's happening is uh, called selection pressure <clears throat> over time. Now, evolutionary reversal happens sometimes. The similar analogous characters may cause taxa to appear related when they are actually not or they're distantly related. And um, these traits, these analogous traits, can obscure the true evolutionary relationship and lead to inaccurate cladograms. And that's why we have to use other things besides just, um, you know, these analogous traits. So which two of these animals are more closely related? We've got a shark, a dolphin on the left, and a leopard on the right, or a cheetah. <laughs> um, so... So the two animals that are most closely related, of course, are the cheetah and the dolphin <clears throat> because they are, um, both of them are mammals, actually. Um, the dolphin appears more related to the shark, but a shark is a fish and a dolphin is a mammal. So the two that are most closely related are the dolphin and the cheetah. And then the animal that had an evolutionary reversal would be the dolphin um, because um, the fish came first in evolutionary history and they diverged um, the groups that diverged after that were the amphibians and then the reptiles um, and then the mammals and the um, reptiles were lived on land they were terrestrial and the mammals did also so um, a dolphin is a mammal that ended up back in an aquatic environment. So it's the dolphin that had an evolutionary reversal. All right, convergent evolution, <clears throat> again, are structures evolving from the same evolutionary pressures, but not from a common ancestral trait. So the wings in birds and the wings in insects like dragonflies or butterflies um, are examples of convergent evolution. In other words, the two um, organisms have converged and become more alike over time, but not because they have a common ancestor. And leglessness in worms and leglessness in snakes. Worms and snakes are not um, related very closely related, but they don't have legs. So um, over time, what we've seen in worms and snakes is convergent evolution. And then evolutionary reversal is when we see traits that are lost and then um, ancestral traits that are lost and then they come back. Um, so ancestral traits are sometimes lost in descendants in one group. For example, the loss of limbs in snakes, because all other reptiles have legs, and then um, the loss of hind limbs in cetaceans. So um, what happened with reptiles is the reptiles, in evolutionary history, the reptiles with legs came first, and then, but before that, the fish came before the reptiles, and the fish did not have legs. So the reptiles had, had legs, and then snakes um, are where we see the evolutionary reversal back to no legs. All right, so the best comparisons are DNA and RNA comparisons. In other words, um, nucleic acid or genetic material comparisons. When we compare DNA from different organisms, um, we, we can get really specific with the percentages of the DNA that are alike and the percentages that are different. Um, 
but the limitations of using just DNA comparisons. It says with only four different nucleotides, sequences may appear homologous when they're not, especially if they're short sequences. And certain mutations, like insertions, deletions, and frame shift mutations, that shift sequences can give the appearance of being unrelated even when they are. So it's really important when they do DNA comparisons that they use many different samples of DNA um, and that the, the, they have to be very careful to not to um, overlook similarities that really are not similarities. <clears throat> Understanding evolutionary relationships is important, and the reason is um, research on related species may help to better understand human health and medical issues. We do use animals for um, medical research. Um, whether you agree or disagree with that, um, understanding evolutionary relationships helps us track the evolution of parasites and viruses. Um, parasites, particularly bacteria and protozoans, and viruses can evolve very quickly, very, very quickly, and they can evolve genes that give them resistance to the drugs that we have and the, um, the vaccines that we have available. So, um, if if we can learn to track the evolution of those genes and those uh, tr those new resistance traits, we can maybe um, do something about it before it's too late. Um, understanding evolutionary relationship helps us to use biotechnology to genetically engineer our crops and our livestock to produce more effective drugs. For example, human insulin, which is now manufactured in bacteria. Um, the gene is inserted into bacteria, and the bacteria actually produce human insulin. So we don't have to use insulin from cows or pigs. Um, cladistics <clears throat> is, the, is a process to arrange the taxa or the groups by homologous characters or traits into clades or branches. And um, that is a cladogram when you do that. What you're looking at here is a cladogram. And the goal is to produce cladograms where all clades are monophyletic. So all the clades. Um, and monophyletic just means that the clades, uh, the organisms in that clade um, had a common ancestor. So a monophyletic group includes all the descendants of a common ancestor, and it includes that common ancestor. All organisms within a clade stem from a single point or node on the tree, on the phylogenetic tree. A clade may contain multiple groups, as in the case of animals, fungi, and plants, or a single group, as in the case of flagellate. So this is a clade. Actually, it says not clades. Oh, okay. Flagellates are a clade, but ciliates and flagellates together are not a clade. So if you look at down at the bottom, it's just saying that ciliates and flagellates, that group would not be considered a clade because they don't share a common ancestor. They're separate branches of the tree. And animals and plants would not be considered a clade. You would have to include fungi. So animals, fungi, and plants would be a clade. Flagellates would be a clade um, by themselves, just not including other, um, other groups of organisms. And organisms, taxa, groups of organisms, evolve from common ancestors and then diversify. And this is repeated over and over and over throughout history. Um, 